I would like to take a minute to introduce Dr. Stoltz. Dr. Stoltz is um, a professor of medicine at the University of Utah, and he is in the Division of General Medicine also at the U, at the University of Utah Medical S um, Center. He's a consultant for hypertension to the Utah Department of Health, and he's also on the Million Hearts Committee. Um, as, um, pardon me, Heather said, he is a preeminent knowledge of all things hypertension, and we are very, very lucky to have him here today. His presentation will talk a, a lot about the way that we're going to go in the BYS program towards um, automated office blood pressure measurement, accurate measurement of blood pressure, and um, how that relates to our clients and what we need to know. So please give your attention to Dr. Stoltz, and I'm looking forward to, see what, to hearing what he has to say. So can people uh, hear me pretty well? All good. So I'm delighted to have the opportunity today to talk about accurate blood pressure measurement and the accurate diagnosis of hypertension because that's been the focus uh, of the Utah Department of Health and uh, the Million Hearts program here in Utah for the last few years. Well, hypertension remains the leading risk factor for global mortality, and it's been termed the largest epidemic ever known to mankind. The prevalence of hypertension in 2016, 29% of adult Americans, but that's expected to increase to about 41% uh, by the year 2030 as the population ages and as obesity rates increase. Uh, 40% of adult black Americans have hypertension. This is the largest uh, prevalence of any subpopulation in the world. But the numbers that always stand out to me are that 63% of Americans age 60 and over have hypertension. And if we're fortunate enough, or as I increasingly look at it, unfortunate enough to live to be over 85, 90% of us will have hypertension. All this translates to about 80 million hypertensive Americans, responsible for 60% of all strokes, 50% of heart failure and chronic kidney disease, 30% of end-stage renal disease, and 25% of myocardial infarctions and premature deaths. This is obviously a big deal. Well, again, if we look at prevalence of hypertension, it is highest in African Americans, lower in whites and Hispanics, but surprisingly, lowest in Asian Americans at just 25%. But if we look at hypertension control rates below 140 over 90, 51%, the highest, is in the white population. It is somewhat lower in black and Hispanic American populations. And the lowest control rate is in the Asian American population at just 37%. If we look at persons age 40 and over, the control rates are about 50%. But if we look at the 7 million Americans that are hypertensive age 18 to 39, the hypertension control rate is a dismal 33%. Uh, with just 50% treated, only 69% even aware that they have hypertension. So we need to do a better job of focusing on both the Asian American and the young adult hypertensive populations. Well, we're gonna summarize uh, as we start what are the key concepts that we're gonna talk about today in the diagnosis of hypertension. First, we have to measure blood pressure accurately to manage hypertension properly but we usually don't do so. Second, there is no current perfect way to measure blood pressure and diagnose hypertension. Third, out-of-office blood pressure measurement, either 24-hour monitoring, or if that's not available, home blood pressure monitoring is necessary to accurately diagnose hypertension. You cannot do it in the office alone. Next, we're gonna look at the concept of automated office blood pressure measurement that is performed with patients completely isolated in the exam room during the measurements. This is termed in the literature now AOBP, instead of using the traditional observed office blood pressure measurement. And we're gonna see that this is a very useful complement 
to hypertension diagnosis and office blood pressure measurement. And finally, the threshold blood pressure levels to define and diagnose hypertension are highly variable. And they depend on how we measure blood pressure, they depend on where we measure blood pressure, and they depend on which hypertension guideline that we choose to follow. And there are three new hypertension guidelines this year that we'll talk about. Well, the newest guideline is the ACC, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association 2017 hypertension guideline. This was commissioned by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute in 2014. It was finally completed and published in November of 2017, and it has been reviewed and accepted by the 11 different societies that you see listed there. But very important, there's controversy. In two groups, the American Academy of Family Practice, representing many family physicians, and the American College of Physicians, representing many internal medicine physicians, have rejected the proposed new blood pressure thresholds and blood pressure targets suggested by this guideline, as we'll see. This is a very comprehensive guideline. It covers diagnosis, treatment, prevention, and plan of care in 47 subsections with a whopping 169 online pages, and they provide 106 evidence-based graded recommendations for hypertension diagnosis and management. And those are based on randomized clinical trials, on meta-analyses, but in other cases, on observational studies, and in a few cases, just based on expert opinion alone. You can get this document for free at the website that's listed there. Well, what is new in this new hypertension guideline? First, there is a brand new blood pressure classification scheme that is very controversial. Second, they emphasize, as do most guidelines, that out-of-office blood pressure measurement is necessary to accurately diagnose hypertension. They prescribe new target blood pressure levels. And we now treat hypertension not just according to blood pressure level, but also according to a patient's 10-year cardiovascular risk of a heart attack or stroke. The guideline suggests using initial low-dose two-drug therapy for most patients rather than initial one-drug therapy that we've always done, and it favors long-acting thiazide diuretics in dapamide and chlorthalidone rather than the more commonly used but short-acting hydrochlorothiazide. And it suggests that we regularly adjust antihypertensive therapy using home blood pressure monitoring. So let's look at some of these concepts here. This is the new classification scheme. On the left, you see the old classification scheme, JNC7, and on the right, the new ACC AHA. Both groups define a normal blood pressure as below 120 over 80, but things differ after that. The new guideline defines a, quote, elevated pressure as 120 to 129 over less than 80. And their new diagnosis of hypertension is 130 over 80 or higher, not the old 140 over 90 or higher. With stage one hypertension defined as 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, and stage two hypertension as 140 over 90 or higher. This is totally different than what we have done before. Well, this new classification scheme will certainly increase hypertension prevalence and it magnifies the public health epidemic. Now, according to the older guidelines, JNC7, blood pressure 140 over 90 or higher, or in diabetic patients or chronic kidney disease patients, 130 over 80 or higher, 32% of the adult population, that is roughly 70 to 80 million persons, were hypertensive. But using the new guideline, 46% of adult Americans are hypertensive, that translates to 103 million people. And you can see the different prevalences of hypertension in the different racial and ethnic groups and in the different age groups. But as we'll see, new or intensified hypertension therapy is only gonna be recommended for about another 12 million persons. <clears throat> well, this is what the guideline recommends 
for lifestyle and drug therapy. If you look at the left side of the screen, for patients with the, quote, elevated blood pressure, 120 to 129 over less than 80, only lifestyle therapy, no medication, just lifestyle therapy. In the middle of the slide, stage one hypertension, and remember that's 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, you are supposed to calculate 10-year cardiovascular risk. If it is less than 10% 10-year risk of heart attack and stroke, and that is the case in about 70% of patients who have a blood pressure 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, these patients also get lifestyle therapy alone, no medications. On the other hand, if you have that stage one hypertension, 130 to 139 over 80 to 89, and your 10-year risk of a heart attack and stroke is 10% or higher, and that would be patients who already have clinical cardiovascular disease, or if you went ahead and calculated that risk and found it to be 10% or higher, or if you have diabetes or chronic kidney disease, or if you are age 65 and over and ambulatory and community dwelling, those patients also have a greater than 10-year, 10% uh, 10 10-year cardiovascular risk. Those patients get both lifestyle therapy and pharmacologic therapy. Stage two hypertension patients, blood pressure 140 over 90 or higher, those patients also get lifestyle therapy and pharmacologic therapy. And the recommendation is that we follow these patients up every single month, adjust the medications every single month until the blood pressure is controlled below 130 over 80. And so the target blood pressure in this new guideline for all patients is below 130 over 80. That's a big change. So why do they propose a new classification of blood pressure? Four reasons. First, we have known for a long time that there is a log linear progressive increase in the risk of heart attack and stroke and it begins at a systolic blood pressure of just 115 millimeters of mercury, such that after 115, every two millimeter increase in systolic blood pressure increases your risk of stroke death by 10% and your risk of myocardial infarction death by 7%. Second, if we compare cardiovascular risk in patients with a normal blood pressure below 120 over 80, to the elevated pressure of 120 to 129, we see that that elevated pressure increases cardiovascular events 10 to 50%. And if we look at the new stage one hypertension, 130 to 139, that level of blood pressure increases your risk of heart attack and stroke by 50 to 100%. And those two groups comprise 25% of the US adult population. Next, recent studies have shown that 63% of all cardiovascular disease events actually occur in persons with a blood pressure less than 140 over 90. And finally, some, although not all, meta-analyses of randomized clinical trials do indicate treatment benefit at blood pressure levels less than 140 over 90. <clears throat> but there's controversy. The other two guidelines that came out this year are quite different. So if you look on the left of the slide at the ACC AHA 2017 guideline, you see that for patients at low or moderate cardiovascular risk, the threshold with a less than 10% 10 year risk, the threshold to treat with drugs is 140 over 90 or higher, and the target's below 130 over 80. If you look at, quote, high cardiovascular risk with a greater than 10% 10 year cardiovascular risk, the threshold to treat with drugs is 130 over 80. And again, the target is below 130 over 80. But if you look at the new Canadian guidelines, and they have among the hyper, highest hypertension control rates in the world, uh, they go very differently. For patients at low cardiovascular risk, and they define those as having hypertension but no other cardiovascular risk factors. They suggest the threshold of treatment with drugs is 160 over 100, and you treat below 140 over 90. But if you have one cardiovascular disease risk factor, you get into the moderate risk group, 
And then they treat if you're 140 over 90 or higher, below 140 over 90. If you're 130 over 80, if you have diabetes and you're 130 over 80 or higher, they treat below 130 over 80. But if you are at high cardiovascular risk, they treat at 130 over 80 and they treat below 120 over 80. In sharp contrast are the recommendations from the American College of Physicians and the American Academy of Family Practice. They suggest for persons age 60 and over, you don't need to treat with drugs unless the blood pressure is 150 over 90 or higher, and you only treat below 140 over 90. If, on the other hand, you've had a stroke or transient ischemic attack, or you have clinical cardiovascular disease, or you have bad kidney function or diabetes or metabolic syndrome, those patients they will treat if they're 140 over 90 or higher to below 140 over 90. So basically, as you can see, you can do whatever the hell you want <laughs> and find a guideline that will justify it. So how do we make sense of all of these different guidelines? Dr. Messerly, I think, has a very good idea. And he stated, accordingly, there will never be only one way to diagnose and treat hypertension. To uniformly lower blood pressure of all hypertensive patients below 130 over 80 has to be considered absurd, regardless of the ACC AHA guidelines. However, equally absurd, would it be to maintain blood pressure levels below 150 over 90 in all patients above age 60 as the ACP AAFP guidelines are telling us. And what this says is we need to individualize our blood pressure goals according to the patients sitting in front of us, according to their cardiovascular risk, according to what we think life expectancy is, uh, according to how many medications they're already on, we need to take all those things into consideration. Well, can we do better than these very dismal 50% hypertension control rates? The answer is yes. And if you look in the lower left-hand corner, Kaiser Permanente, using team-based care, increased their hypertension control rate from just 44% in 2001 to over 90% in 2013, again using team-based care. Leaving things in the hands of primary care clinicians never improves quality. We need to find new roles for existing office staff, or if we have the finances, add new staff, such as clinical pharmacists. And the Kaiser steps are listed here. First, they used both paper and later electronic medical record registries to identify all the patients in Kaiser who had uncontrolled hypertension so that they could call them back and re-evaluate them. Second, and this is what we're going to focus on today, they worked really hard to improve the accuracy of clinical blood pressure measurement. They made an enormous effort they use only electronic measurements, no manual blood pressure measurements. And as we'll see, our approach here in Utah has been to try to get clinics to use AOBP. In addition, Kaiser said we got to decrease therapeutic inertia. People are sitting on high blood pressures too long. And so instead of using one drug to start therapy, they use low doses of two drugs to start therapy, which gives you a much better blood pressure reduction. They adjust therapy every two to four weeks until people are controlled. They use an algorithm that they accepted and everybody in the system has to use in most patients. They use a home blood pressure monitoring program. They have, have that algorithm administered not by the primary care clinicians, but by either RNs or clinical pharmacists. That gets away from that therapeutic inertia and they look at their performance all the time, regular feedback. And finally, but much more difficult, is trying to improve treatment adherence. We really don't know how to do this. We can try phone follow-up uh, after medication initiation or changes. We can use walk-in blood pressure checks for free, intensive patient education. We don't actually have great ways of doing this. Well, let's look now at blood pressure measurement. 
So this slide shows you on the left the key techniques of blood pressure measurement, and on the right, the errors that occur if these techniques are not followed. Notice that most, most, most technical errors falsely elevate the blood pressure, and often to a very substantial degree. Patients need to rest five minutes before the measurement. Never happens. Seated, back supported in a chair, not on the exam table. Cuff at mid-sternal level. Correct cuff size, more than 50% of our patients need at least a large adult cuff. The bladder center directly over the brachial artery. If we're doing manual measurement, and we shouldn't be, but if we are, deflating no more rapidly than two millimeters per second. The average blood pressure measure deflates at five to 10 millimeters per second. No talking during the measurement. We did a study, which we published, and found that talking either by the patient or the person measuring the blood pressure or both was ongoing during 71% of blood pressure measurements, and that increases blood pressure by 17 over 13 millimeters of mercury. And then if that initial blood pressure that we measure is above goal, we need to take a total of three readings one minute apart. We drop the first reading, which tends to be falsely elevated in many patients due to what is called an alerting response, and we average the last two. And that maneuver will reclassify 18 to 34 percent of patients hypertensive on the first reading, normotensive on the last two. Does this ever happen? Hell no, it doesn't ever happen. Three guideline quality blood pressures take eight to 11 minutes. It isn't gonna happen. Repeated staff training. Eight out of nine quality improvement studies have been unsuccessful in a sustained improvement in office blood pressure measurement technique. It just doesn't happen. So what can we do? Can office blood pressure measurement accurately diagnose hypertension? The answer is no. As was stated in an editorial this year, more often than not, the measurement of office blood pressure is not only inaccurate, but also downright misleading. Two reasons for that. First, incorrect office blood pressure measurement technique is the rule, not the exception. Six studies, more than 8,000 patients, compared usual office blood pressure measurement by usual office staff with guideline technique blood pressure measurement by a trained RN in the same patient. And simply using correct technique reduces blood pressure on average 10 over 7 millimeters of mercury. But the second reason we can't use office blood pressure measurement is the enormous prevalence of white coat hypertension, where blood pressure is high in the office but normal the rest of the time out of the office. If we look at patients with an office pressure 140 over 90 or higher, 15 to 30 percent of those patients have white coat hypertension and don't need treatment. If we look just at the patients with a systolic pressure of 140 to 159, 40 to 50 percent of those patients have white coat hypertension and do not need treatment. Even if the systolic pressure is 180, over, uh, 180 or higher, 10% of those patients have normal blood pressure out of the office. So these two problems result in inaccurate office hypertension diagnosis in 20 to 65% of patients. This is unacceptable. <clears throat> so how can we improve the office screening for hypertension? I didn't say diagnosis, I said screening. Well, the first thing to improve office blood pressure accuracy is we should be using automated electronic devices, not manual blood pressure measurement. This is recommended by all the current guidelines. But you have to be sure that the device that you're using has been validated for accuracy by one of the three international protocols. And you can find lists of those validated devices at the three websites listed there or in the journal article that is listed there. We prefer those devices which will take, take and automatically average three to five blood pressure measurements over a four to seven minute period. But what we really want to do is to have those devices take the blood pressure with the patient completely isolated in the exam room, completely alone. 
Sequential automated office blood pressure performed on patients isolated in the exam room is called AOBP. And there are three validated devices by which you can do this. The Omron Heme 907, the Welch Allen Pro BP 2400, and the MicroLife Watch BP Office. So this is an example of how AOBP works in a study of 284 hypertension patients in primary care. The first blood pressure measurement was taken with an observer in the room, and it was hypertensive, 147 over 82. But as soon as the patient was left in complete isolation, blood pressure dropped immediately and substantially, and it stabilized at about the third or fourth measurement, such that in this study, the average of the five isolated measurements was 136 over 78, that is 11 over 4 millimeters lower than that first hypertensive measurement. Why? This is white coat hypertension. And the proof of that is demonstrated in these five studies that have more than uh, almost 2,000 patients that compared routine office blood pressure measurement by usual uh, office staff then with AOBP performed with the patient isolated in the room, and then they compared it to out-of-office blood pressure with a 24-hour monitor study. And what you see is that on average, the routine office blood pressure was about 150 over 85. The AOBPs performed in isolation were about 135 over 85, and that was about what the out-of-office blood pressure was. AOBP performed on patients in isolation is almost the same as out-of-office blood pressure. That is, it almost eliminates white coat hypertension. So the value of automated office blood pressure on patients resting alone in the exam room over manual office blood pressure, multiple. First, because it's automated, it eliminates many of the technical errors of manual blood pressure measurement. It's more accurate. Second, because you're getting multiple measurements, uh, it improves reproducibility. Three, it is more efficient than taking three manual measurements. You can get it done in four minutes as opposed to the eight to 11 minutes. And during that four minutes, your medical assistant, your nurse, whoever, can be out doing other things. But most important, we think, is that AOBP reduces, not quite eliminates, white coat hypertension. And so that decreases the need for the labor-intense out-of-office blood pressure measurement. And finally, AOBP has been shown to be a stronger predictor of cardiovascular events than routine office blood pressure. It improves patient safety. AOBP is now considered the optimal approach to measure office blood pressure in Canada, in Australia, and it's favorably reviewed in the new ACC AHA guideline. So how do we use AOBP in our offices at the university and at the Veterans Hospital? We try to get a high quality observed electronic blood pressure measurement first, one measurement. If that measurement is less than 130 over 80, if you want to go by the new ACC AHA guideline, or if it's less than 140 over 90, if you want to go by the other guidelines, you're done. Most of the errors falsely elevate blood pressure. You can simply record it and you're done. But if the blood pressure is greater than 130 over 80 or greater than 140 over 90, depending on which guideline you're following, then you need to do AOBP in the exam room or in a quiet area of the waiting room. You don't have to have a five minute rest period. You don't have to observe the first reading, but the patient has to be completely alone. Then if that blood pressure is greater than 130 over 80, if you're following the new guideline, or importantly, if it's greater than 135 over 85, not 140 over 90, if you're following the older guidelines, then you need out of office blood pressure to diagnose hypertension. So we have tried to develop an educational program for AOBP in Utah. Uh, we've done this through the Utah Department of Health, the Million Hearts Program, and through Health Insight. Right now, AOBP is used in all university primary care clinics. It is scheduled to be incorporated into the Intermountain Clinics sometime uh, here in 2018. We have been pushing to get its uptake in other Utah clinics. You can get an excellent training video 
at the university website, but we also have it published uh, on the Health Insight. Very nice video, professionally done, tells you and your staff exactly how AOBP is accomplished. So, out-of-office blood pressure measurement is now considered essential to diagnose hypertension. This was the United States Preventive Services Task Force Guideline in 2015. Ambulatory blood pressure monitoring is recommended to confirm high blood pressure before the diagnosis of hypertension, except in cases for which immediate initiation of therapy is necessary. That's almost never. Good quality evidence suggests that confirmation of hypertension using home blood pressure monitoring may be acceptable, but more research is needed on the best home blood pressure monitoring protocols to follow up elevated office blood pressure measurements. This is a level A recommendation. And in addition to the United States Preventive Services Task Force, the new ACC AHA guideline, all of the other international guidelines indicate that you have to do out-of-office blood pressure to confirm the diagnosis of hypertension. So, how do we do out-of-office blood pressure measurement? 24-hour monitoring has a number of challenges. Its availability is relatively limited. Its utilization is relatively infrequent. At the health department, we did a study in 2015, which we published, and found that 24-hour that monitoring was available only to about 25% of primary care clinics in Utah. And for that reason, Health Insight and the Department of Health have at the website you see listed there provided the location and phone numbers of all the places that you can call to arrange for 24-hour monitoring. Reimbursement is a concern for 24-hour monitoring. It probably doesn't cover the costs. This is what the 24-hour monitors look like. The device is included in that pouch on the patient's belt, but it can also be included on a shoulder strap. Uh, the pouch is connected by a flexible tube to the blood pressure cuff on the patient's left arm. This is not a big deal. So some practical aspects of this is 24-hour monitoring automatically measures your blood pressure every 15 to 30 minutes during the day, every 30 to 60 minutes at night. Has to be used on a work day because blood pressures during work days are higher than blood pressures on weekends. And you have to know what the threshold blood pressures are to diagnose hypertension. And as we have stated repeatedly, it depends on which guideline you use. If you're using the ACC guideline that has that 130 over 80 goal, you see the threshold blood pressures to confirm hypertension. If you're using the office 140 over 90 goal, you see that the blood pressures are a little higher for the thresholds to diagnose hypertension. And in African Americans, they're even a little higher than that. Well, what about home blood pressure monitoring? That's a, lot, that's a lot more available, and it has a number of evidence-based advantages over office blood pressure. First, it more accurately diagnoses hypertension. It detects white coat hypertension, as we've discussed, and as we'll show you, it also detects a new phenomena called masked hypertension, where blood pressure in the office is normal, and blood pressure out of the office is persistently high. It provides superior prediction of cardiovascular disease, 17 to 39% better than office blood pressure. It's more available at lower cost with greater patient preference than is 24-hour monitoring. It improves hypertension control rates by up to 30% if we have a hypertension control program where we systematically titrate the medications according to the home blood pressures and we vigorously communicate with that patient. It improves hypertension therapy adherence by an absolute 18%, and it decreases the need for inconvenient, expensive office visits. A lot of good things. But not surprisingly, there are a lot of bad things. Home blood pressure monitoring appears to be 25% less accurate than 24-hour monitoring to diagnose hypertension. It overdiagnoses white coat hypertension. And a lot of patients who look like they have white coat hypertension on 24-hour monitoring turn out to have hypertension on 24-hour monitoring. So it's recommended that if you do home monitoring to make the diagnosis, you do a second week-long course of home monitoring or you do a 24-hour monitor. 
Effective real world utilization is infrequent. Just like we don't measure blood pressure right, the patients never measure blood pressure right either. Incorrect te patient technique is the rule, not the exception. The studies show that only 17 to 33 percent of patients doing home blood pressures have adequate enough technique to give you a valid blood pressure. Reporting bias. 12 to 36 percent of patients leave out the high readings or fabricate readings that they didn't do. Uh, we know the same thing ha happens with self-monitoring of blood glucose. To develop a home blood pressure monitoring program in your clinic can be a challenge, but it can be done. Uh, we have done it, but it requires a fair amount of work, as we'll show you. Uh, home blood pressure monitoring doesn't always lower blood pressure in hypertensive patients, particular patients in lower socioeconomic areas. The studies haven't been very positive. And finally, the studies, and one of which is ours, find that 20% of patients won't even do home blood pressure monitoring even when you offer them a free loaner blood pressure cuff. Won't do it. So these are two studies with nearly 1,700 patients that looked at patient accuracy in home blood pressure measurement. And what you see, it's bad. They just don't do well. And only 17 to 33% complied with 80% of the criteria listed there. You're getting numbers that aren't useful unless you have trained the patient. So what are the requirements for accurate home blood pressure monitoring? First, you have to get an optimal device. The device has to be validated by one of the three international protocols. Most of what you buy in the drugstore uh, is not validated for accuracy. You can get lists of those validated cuffs at the journal article and at the five or six websites that are listed there. That's what your patient has to buy. Arm cuffs only, no wrist cuffs. Wrist cuffs are less accurate. And you have to make sure your patient gets a cuff that fits their midarm circumference. And many patients will need a large adult cuff. They now have some self-adjusting cuffs that uh, adjust to regular size arms and big arms. The only time we ever use a wrist cuff is if we can't get an arm cuff big enough to fit that arm. And then we have to use a wrist cuff. And remember when you use wrist cuffs, you have to have the wrist at heart level. You'd like a cuff that has memory storage and automatically takes three readings in one, at one minute intervals and averages them, it's not mandatory. But even validated cuffs can be inaccurate in some patients. And so you have to confirm the accuracy of the device in your office against a cuff of known accuracy. How do you do that? Well, there's two ways to validate the accuracy of the cuff. The first way is you take nine sequential blood pressure measurements at 30 second intervals in the same arm. You alternate the, an accurate office device with the patient's home device and then you average the last four office devices and compare them to the last three home device measurements, and they ought to be within five millimeters of mercury uh, of each other. The other approach, which I prefer, is to do simultaneous blood pressure measurements in both arms. You do an, initially an accurate office device on the left arm, a home device on the right arm, and then you switch arms. Accurate device on the right, home device on the left, and you compare the averages of the office devices and the home devices, again, should be within five millimeters of mercury. Instruction in proper preparation and technique is essential. You need a written instruction sheet, but that's not enough. You should try to get your patients to watch the Hypertension Canada video on YouTube, which is excellent. But most important, you need to train your patients and actually watch them measure their blood pressure either group or individual instruction. That's the key. You have to teach your patient the recommended monitoring protocol that I'll show you on the next slide. Patients have to record and communicate the data. Seems obvious, often does not happen. Uh, you then need to act on the results, whether you're talking diagnosis or treatment. To develop a home blood pressure monitoring program, Health Insight and the American Medical Association have provided detailed instructions on how to set up your own home blood pressure monitoring program in your clinic at those two websites. What's the protocol that we should teach patients? 
we want to have the patients average 20 to 28 blood pressures over five days. You need that to control for blood pressure variability. So in the morning, patients should take their blood pressure within one hour of awakening, after urination, before eating, before blood pressure meds, after resting quietly three to five minutes, not looking at the computer, not looking at the television, not reading, nothing else. Measure their blood pressure two to three times a minute apart. Same protocol in the evening, either before supper or before bed, dealer's choice. Uh, but in the end, you've got to average 20 to 28 blood pressures. And then you have to remember, what is the goal home blood pressure? The goal of home blood pressure is below 130 over 80 if you're following the new guidelines. It's below 135 over 85 if you're following those other guidelines. If there is a discrepancy between clinic and home, strongly consider 24-hour monitoring. So this slide, and I think this, you have this somewhere, they're going to send it out to you because uh, you probably can't read it. Uh, this is a summary from the new guideline from the ACC AHA about how to use out-of-office blood pressure in untreated patients, and this one is how to use it in treated patients. Now, a very important concept that out-of-office blood pressure monitoring will show you is that there are different blood pressure subsets. If you look at the lower left corner of the box, normotension is patients who have a normal office pressure and a normal out-of-office pressure. If you look at the upper right part of the box, true sustained hypertension, you have a high office pressure and a high out-of-office pressure. But the lower right, you see white coat hypertension. High office pressure, normal out-of-office pressure, and we believe those patients have the same cardiovascular prognosis as normotensive patients and they don't need to be treated. But if you look in the upper left there, you see masked hypertension. These are patients who have a normal office pressure, often high normal, but they are persistently high out of the office. And these patients appear to have the same adverse prognosis as patients with true sustained hypertension. But we don't have any treatment trials for those patients thus far. And remember, the thresholds to separate those out depend on which guideline you're following and whether you're measuring observed or unobserved blood pressures. This is a critical slide for you. This shows you the thresholds to diagnose hypertension if you're using observed blood pressure measurements or if you're using unobserved AOBP measurements or if you're using out-of-office blood pressure measurements. And it adjusts those thresholds according to the two guidelines, whether you use the new ACC AHA or whether you're using the other guidelines, 130 over 80 office goal or 140 over 90 office goals. And so you see the equivalent of guideline quality observed office blood pressure for AOBP on an isolated patient, for home blood pressure uh, done with averaging at least 12 to 28, preferably 20 to 28 readings over uh, five to seven days, and the thresholds to diagnose hypertension uh, by the 24-hour monitor. So let's summarize once more here. If you have an observed office blood pressure, 130 over 80 or higher, if you're following the new ACCHA guideline, or 140 over 90 if you're going by the other guidelines, you then need to do AOBP either in the exam room or a quiet area of the waiting room. You don't need a rest period, but the patient has to be alone. You don't need to watch the first reading. You can go about your other duties while those blood pressures are being done and come back in about five minutes. If the blood pressures are above threshold uh, on the right, you need out-of-office blood pressure monitoring. If the blood pressures are below threshold, the patients are normotensive, you need to follow them up in a year. Last notes, how do you measure blood pressure in pregnancy? It's all different than in the real world here. Uh, pregnant women have altered hemodynamics that affect the accuracy of electronic blood pressure measurements. That occurs with uncomplicated pregnancy, and those hemodynamic changes change from one month one to month nine, and they change in preeclampsia. Up until just this year, we have had almost no data about validated electronic blood pressure devices to use in pregnancy. But the article you see referenced here now gives you what are validated devices in pregnancy. 
If you're doing 24-hour monitoring, only two devices have been validated, what's called the BP Lab and then the Welch Allen Quiet Track. Those were validated for pregnancy, but not for preeclampsia yet. Home blood pressure devices, only two have been uh, validated. The MicroLife Watch BP and the Omron MIT, uh, MIT there, Elite, uh, and those work not only in pregnancy, they work in preeclampsia. Office devices. The Omron Heme 907 is accurate, and it also does AOBP. It is accurate in pregnancy. It hasn't been studied in preeclampsia. The other monitors that are listed there, the bottom three, uh, are accurate in pregnant women, and they're also accurate, accurate in preeclampsia here. I think that's enough. Questions? So question, AOBP, will it identify masked hypertension? That's a good question, and the answer is no. The only way to identify masked hypertension is to measure out-of-office blood pressure. Got to measure it. So we tend, in our practice, in any patient in our practice who is at high cardiovascular risk and has a high normal clinic blood pressure, we encourage them to get a home cuff and measure blood pressures out of the office. The normal cardiovascular risks we don't do. Yes? So what uh, home device would you recommend currently? Is there one that's economical? Yeah, you, the, the cost you can get anywhere from $40 to $150 depending on how many whistles and bells you want. Uh, if you buy in bulk, they do a good job. For our study that we did at the university and just published, uh, we got a very high-tech Bluetooth, the whole shooting match, and because we bought 100 of them at once, we got them for $50. So buying in bulk is the way to go, and you can get them for less. Uh, do you have to have one that automatically measures three blood pressures at one-minute intervals and averages them? No, you don't, but I think it's nice. Just make sure it is a validated device by one of those protocols. I have another question. Um, when we say put patients in um, isolation with yep. AOBP, do you mean like no phones, no magazines? No yep. So we often come in the room and find the patient looking at the little computer. No. That raises blood pressure eight points. Don't do it. You have to kick the spouses out. We come in and find spouses arguing, talking, all kinds of stuff. Which monitor do you use for your So we used an Omron Bluetooth one, and it's got about eight digits, which I, don't, I can't remember right now. But it was an Omron device. It automatically measured blood pressure at one minute intervals. Uh, it had all the Bluetooth stuff, which we did not use. Uh, one of the problems that we would like to solve is being able to directly connect automated blood pressure measurements at home into the electronic medical record. Not solved. Well, what we do is we have them step out of the room. We have a little chair that they can sit in. And for that five minutes, they sit in that chair. Got to be out of the room. Absolutely have to be out of the room. Okay. Well, the device give you all three readings, or just the average of the three? It gives you all three readings and also the average of the three. So every now and then, we see a patient who repeatedly is very high on the first one and much lower on the next two. And so in that setting, you may want to be averaging the last two. But in general, we just average all three. That's a myth. Oh. Ab absolute myth. Measuring blood pressures in a mastectomy uh, arm, good studies, it doesn't do squat. 
I think we're good. Thank you.